Hello, Jeremy. I'm so excited to chat with you today. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Sarah. This has been uh, been exciting. Yeah. So how are things going for you guys now that you have moved back from the Bahamas, back to the States, and trying to get everything squared away? Yeah, I think uh, like everybody in the world, possibly uh, the last year to year and a half has just been a bit of a, a whirlwind. But um, we are just very thankful to uh, kind of feel settled for the first time in, in probably three years. Mm -hmm. um, even since moving to the Bahamas, we were um, taking a while to feel settled there. And then, um, as you know, a, a storm uh, mm -hmm. took our house and our, our future away there. And so um, and then transitioning back to international travel during a pandemic was very interesting, to say <laughs> the least. And we've recently bought a house uh, here in Gadsden, Alabama, and uh, I've actually just accepted a, a teaching position um, to teach fourth grade in, in the fall uh, coming up this year. And so uh, we are just very blessed and thankful to uh, feel have somewhere to call home and feel like we we might be able to be somewhere in one place for a little while now. Uh, that's so amazing because it's it's not been easy. Um, you guys have been through a whole lot, and I'm just so thankful that you guys are safe and sound. It, Gaston's going to be a great place um, for y'all to land and really kind of start this next adventure. Um, and you know, you and I, I don't think a lot of people know this, but we've known each other for quite some time. <laughs> Yeah, more, probably more than I'd like to admit now right. as my age becomes more of an issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually was uh, chatting with another friend of ours that went to Auburn and I, I was reminded of, you know, our first classes together. We were both education majors and mm -hmm. all these things going on. And I just, it feels like so long ago, but it also feels like just yesterday. Exactly. It's a, it's a weird feeling. Heather and I uh, talked about that recently. In fact, we're we're celebrating our 16 year wedding anniversary this week. And uh, just to th kind of think back in, in decades now instead of just years. That's <laughs> so, right. I still like to think that 1990 was just like 10 years ago. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, one of the things we talk about, you guys, you're from the Bahamas, but you actually, where we met was in Auburn um, as education majors in the Haley Center. <laughs> like the list yep. just kind of goes on and on about <laughs> all of these things. But, you know, how did you end up at Auburn? Yeah, that's a great question. In fact, I get that question all the time. Uh, born and raised in the Bahamas, my my dad's side of the family goes way back. Uh, so my family's been in the Bahamas for a long time and um, competitive swimming was a, a big part of my life from early years. And um, and that is essentially what uh, drove me to be exposed to a number of uh, college programs, swimming programs. And, and at the time, Auburn was at the top of those. And uh, took a recruiting trip to a number of schools and um, I fell in love with Auburn and uh, decided to, to come to Auburn and really the swim team is what drew me there. Um, and I kind of had an idea that I wanted to uh, be involved in education and uh, so got plugged in there as well. And, uh, and then, you know, from there, everything kind of fell into place. I met uh, Heather, my wife, yeah. uh, my sophomore year there and um, and the rest is history, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. The rest is history, as they say. And, <laughs> you know, you talk about growing up in the Bahamas, you started at a your early age, competitively swimming mm -hmm. in, at the age of 16, you actually accomplished something that most <laughs> people would never even dream of or try. <laughs> so yeah. tell me a little bit about like what sparked this interest for our listeners to find out that you actually swam from Exuma to Nassau. Yeah. Um, yeah, this uh, it requires a little bit of background. So my my dad, in fact, my extended family, we come from a generation of uh, or a family of Olympians. My great uncle and grandfather were Olympic sailors. My dad and uncle were Olympic swimmers. My dad was my coach uh, growing up until I yeah. competed in my first Olympics in, in Sydney in 2000. And and so we're kind of surrounded by this um, uh, this athletic background, this, this drive for uh, the competitive nature. And um, that uh, swim was a 30 mile swim between two islands in the Bahamas, Exuma and Nassau. Nassau is where we live, the capital in the Bahamas. And um, it, it, the, the distance had actually been covered by swimmers before via relay. 
um, uh, orchestrated by my dad as the coach. And, and two times before he had taken his senior swimmers and they would uh, swim at like a half an hour interval and switch and, and they would take all day and, and make that trek. And that was kind of already a, a kind of respected feat um, to, to have accomplished. And sure. I just remember from an early age that I um, had this drive to want to um, try that um, solo by myself if wow. I could make that distance. And it, and it kind of morphed from kind of a joke in the family to I continued to keep bringing it up. And my dad finally was like, I think he's serious about this. And so <laughs> we actually put pen to paper and started looking at dates. And there was a lot of things to be involved. Of course, the weather is a big factor sure. in, uh, in the Bahamas. The tides have, a, have a, a lot to do with it. So we found the right time uh, where the weather is simply uh, usually consistent as far as calmness. And then the, the tides and the specific day that would pull us along at the beginning and switch right in the middle and pull us along into Nassau. And so um, we kind of marked it on the calendar and, and uh, everything kind of worked out. And I actually swam alongside another relay team again that um, every time I had to stop for nutrition and uh, take some recovery drink or a fruit or, um, or I had the, these power gel things. Yeah. Um, there was like when they were first coming out, they did not uh, <laughs> taste very well, no. very great. Um, but I would stop at 15 minute intervals and would the rule was kind of, you don't touch the boat or anything. And they, they would just kind of pass it to me and then uh, take something and keep going. And, and then when I did that, the relay team would switch swimmers and it essentially took us 15 hours um, to swim 30 miles, um, jumped in at about seven o'clock uh, in the morning and touched land at 10 o'clock at night. And um, I like wow. to say, by the time we got there, we really kind of crashed the party. Uh, there were so many people, it, it had started getting announced on the radio, local radio stations that what we were doing and then night fell and I got stung by a jellyfish and this drama started escalating and everybody kind of came down to see what was going on. And there was quite a party going on by the time we actually got there. Um, but it was certainly a, um, uh, a kind of national feat, if you will, uh, very recognizable event that, that yeah. took place. And so it was a really cool experience for me to be a part of at such a young age. Yeah. Well, and it's still talked about today. You know, <laughs> and, yeah. I think that's the conversation that keeps on going because you were, I mean, you were 16 years old when this happened. Yeah. And, right. you know, and now, you know, fast forward, here we are. And since that, you competed at a division one level, you've been to three Olympic Games. So there's a lot of memories that come with this. And as you think back to some of your, you know, Olympic games, what was your favorite memory? Um, that's a, a good question. And I've, I've always said that the kind of N Olympic games in a single factor is, is kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity. And to have been able to experience three of those, it's right. just such a, uh, an amazing experience because each one of them is, has its own identity, its own experience in itself. And um, I would think, I, I would say one that, that spans across all three of my Olympic games is the experience of walking through the uh, stadium uh, in opening ceremonies with my dad, who was wow. the national coach for the Bahamas for each one of those Olympic games. And so him being a former Olympian and my coach and me being an Olympian and us being able to experience that together um has been something that will always uh, be with me and and uh, have a couple of pictures of of us with just like from inside the stadium uh you know looking up in the stadium with with us down in in our congregation of of the Bahamas and um I think those are are kind of the special memories that I've actually just recently was talking with a friend of mine that uh just looking back I think uh it, it, as athletes look back uh, further and further from their career, the accolades and the the uh, pinnacles tend to mean a little less, and yeah. the the valleys and the the struggles that you uh, went through actually tend to mean a little bit more. Um, and and I, I'm kind of experiencing that a little bit with just uh, just cherishing everything of my experiences and not just kind of holding on to, to the nuggets of success that I had along the way. 
Yeah, and, and I think that's something that, you know, students should understand and parents should also understand is like, we all have these like pinnacle feats. We always like, whatever that level is for that athlete, they are going to reach a mountaintop at some point, whether it's in their high school career, their college career, maybe they become an Olympian, you know, mm -hmm. but at the same time, we have so many setbacks. So how did you, you know, how did you overcome some of those? And what were some of those setbacks that you had throughout your career? Yeah, I think um, probably one of the uh, ongoing, uh, I, I would say the repetitive struggles that I faced at an international level um, was I uh, placed fourth a number of times in a number of events. Mm -hmm. um, it was, ended up being branded that I, I won the medal of iron <laughs> instead <laughs> of a gold, silver or bronze uh, because it, it's so tough. It's so hard to just miss the podium um and and it feels in that moment like such a defeat or or a valley yeah. um and it's hard to in that moment look at hey I, you know i just swam the fastest i've ever swam in my life or hey i'm the fourth fastest in this world championship <laughs> event or right. you know whatever whatever you is it is you kind of you know you obviously have that goal of being on the podium and, and whatnot so that, that was a struggle um that i i had to deal with a, a number of times um in my career that that kind of comes to mind but again kind of going back to that as you look back um and and the peaks mean less and the valleys mean more uh you certainly gain a lot in in life the application of life by those pinnacles but uh you i would argue that you gain more from mm -hmm. how you handle yourself going through the valleys and and i think those are the applicable times uh that really mean more as you get older into life. And so, you know, if I'm speaking to parents and, and student athletes that are, are really trying to accomplish as much as they can, um, don't be discouraged yeah. by uh, failures. They are just as important as, as the pinnacles and um, they mean a lot. And, and how you handle them and learn from them means a lot um, and how you uh, prepare yourself to be a good employee or to be right. a, a good leader yourself if you're an, an entrepreneur or be a good husband or, or father, all of those things, um, they translate into life um, very clearly. Yeah. And, you know, as we move forward and student athletes experience these valleys and these setbacks, you know, what, what are some tangible things maybe that you did that you would want to encourage other students to start doing? Because, you know, a lot of times, we carry that failure so much inside of us and yeah. sometimes it can be a big roadblock yeah i would say um the most practical thing i would say to do is to set multiple goals um mm. and and we we've talked about that a lot in my career with just you know the the simple step of writing a goal down instead yeah. of just saying it um, makes a huge difference in in the the percentage uh, of accomplishing that goal yeah. and and not just one goal, but multiple goals and uh, different levels, uh, angles. And so that when you are able to finish a competition or, or what have you, and, and able to look back, you can assess on a multi-level um, kind of reflection of, okay, maybe I didn't meet this goal, but there was this goal and I made it here. And, and you're always able to analyze, look back, and then that helps you in the next step for the next season to look forward and adjust those goals um, in the future. And I think uh, to add to that um, a little bit more abstractly, uh, I think it's very, very important um, for student athletes to have a strong self-identity mm. outside of their performance yeah. in, in their sport. Um, and for me, um, I think the, my faith uh, in Jesus had, had a huge uh, part of that, um, and that helped ground me in those failures and those disappointments, and, and I don't want to take anything away from the fact that they are hard, and they're emotional, yeah. and, um, and they can lead into depression, and, and all sure. of those things, especially if that's what you, you held on to as far as your identity, and, and that's who you were, and then if that crumbles, um, you know, you really find yourself in a dark place. So, um, you know, wh whatever it is that you find identity in, try to find purpose and um, um, a 
sense of your your structure and your life outside of your sport. Uh, for me, that was uh, community in my church, whether mm -hmm. it's um, a fraternity or a sorority or anything like that, um, so that you kind of have a multifaceted uh, approach to life, I guess. Yeah. And that is actually something we talk a lot about on the podcast is goal mm -hmm. setting and the right mindset and how do we move forward? Because it isn't easy. Being a college athlete, is not for the faint of heart. No yeah. matter what level you play on, whether it's in the you know junior college level to division one, yeah. you are going to have setbacks. And I love what you said about writing those goals down because it yeah. is proven when we have written our goals down, we are more likely to reach those and they're able to help us when we do experience those setbacks. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So one of the things you mentioned too is about identity. And I know a lot of times mm -hmm. as, you know, former athletes and athletes, we carry, I'm putting myself in that category too, of mm -hmm. we carry a lot of that when we move forward in life, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Now you are no longer competing at the international stage. You kind mm -hmm. of transitioned into real life. Um, mm -hmm. But <laughs> how did you adjust from like life after sport, if you will? Yeah. Um, I think, uh, honestly, I, I feel very fortunate um, for me uh, that I had this opportunity uh, being in education. I knew I wanted to be a teacher and uh, the timing of everything worked out so well that I was actually hired as a teacher before my final Olympics in Beijing in 2008. In fact, I had to get special permission to be a week and a half late to my first <laughs> job because I was at the Olympics. And they, By the they way, hopefully... <laughs> yeah, I'm going to yeah. be in Beijing competing in the Olympics. Is it okay exactly. if I'm late and, to my job? <laughs> and I, I think it was that only, only that reason was why they said yes. Sure. But I say that to say that I literally did not have a single day where mm -hmm. I was just a retired Olympian. I went from flying in late at night and I reported to work the next morning and, and this this identity or this shift of kind of who I was um, was made instantly. Um, and I do, I really do think uh, beyond, I feel being anchored in my, in my faith had a lot to do with me avoiding uh, some really uh, hard transitions mm -hmm. um, as a professional athlete into the real world because I jumped right into my new career in which right. I'm still in. Um, and so I know a lot of uh, professional athletes um, don't have that opportunity. And, um, and I, I say that to say that I think it is very important to find that next thing. And I don't mean to just fill a void, but to right. act with purpose of what you want to do, because all of these athletes have this tremendous discipline, this incredible work ethic, yes. this huge goal setting um, mentality and that so I mean it's like the perfect employee right. you've just got to find the right place that mm -hmm. also gives you passion um, and excitement for for doing the next thing um, we read uh, about athlete after athlete and, and I can mention Michael Phelps in particular and he's finally been able to kind of come out and express uh, some of the struggles that he had after the Olympics uh, and his great feat of eight gold medals to um, kind of going into some really dark places and, and kind of figuring out his own identity. And, and, yeah. and now he's kind of a spokesman for mental health in, in that mm -hmm. uh, area as well. So um, all of that to say, it is very important, I think, to continue to find purpose um, in, in whatever it is you're doing. Yeah. And that starts at an early age too, even at our high school students, mm -hmm. you know, as you're thinking outside of just your field of play, making mm -hmm. sure that you're grounded in your community, whether it's your faith, if that's something that's important to you, of just mm -hmm. knowing that you you surround yourself with the right people so that as you make that transition, even if you don't play at the college level, you are still going to experience some of that identity shift and then going from a collegiate athlete to the working world, if you don't go professional, you are still going to experience that. So that's going to come at every level. And you want to make sure that you are really surrounding yourself with the right people at the right time and having the conversations. That's exactly right. I've always loved the, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I've heard them in a while, but the NCAA commercials where they kind of spotlight a few athletes, but then they 
say, and most of us will be going professional in something other than the sport we're playing. And that's so true. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I, just like you said, I think it's important early on to prepare for that. And, and a lot of times I don't think athletes do. They're so immersed in uh, yeah. what they are and what they're doing, and then they get done with it and, and they kind of are lost in a sense. And so it's important to prepare for that in advance. Yeah. And you know, that comes from the discipline mentality and the hard work that you put into that sport. And, you know, that's something that you all, you know, I mean, if you started your sport with, I could imagine with you before you could even walk, you were in the water, You're right? <laughs> you yeah. know? And so, I mean, there are some kids who they start playing at the age of five and it's, it's something that's ingrained in them. And then, you know, either they turn 18 and they're not playing their sport in college or say, you know, by the age of 22, and you're looking at a span of over almost 15 to 20 years that yeah. people have been involved in their sport if they don't go pro. And it's thinking of how can we continually to make that shift um, yeah. You know, and saying, okay, this is now what my passion, li where my passion lies, what I want to pursue so that I can make a difference. Yeah. And I think, you know, on that note, I, I remember, of course, I was, I was a swimmer at Auburn and during uh, the early 2000s, we were the program to be. We uh, won a number of national championships. And so when it comes to as far as the highest level of competition, that that was us. And I remember our, our coaches from David Marsh, all the way down, all the assistants, they always uh, reminded us that it, it's called student athlete, That's not right. athlete student. And That's so right. that, uh, you know, even at that highest level, we needed to make sure being a student was taking priority. And um, they were very, um, I would say, uh, of course, at the time, I would say hard on us <laughs> as far as keeping up with our academics. That's right. um, we had to man maintain certain GPAs to be eligible to compete on teams. And that was just an inner team rule that, that they had. And, um, and, and it helped us, you know, and right. I think it, it's prepared us for, for the real world just that, so that we didn't just push that off to the side and focus solely on swimming. We still we're able to win championships, but also have this high priority on the next phase of our life. And I would almost venture to guess that if you look at all of these national championship teams, these conference championship teams, a lot of them have, you know, either some GPA requirements or they have team rules. And, and, and when it's truly a team sport, that is something that people are working towards. And so students that are listening, you know, if you think, oh, we're going to go win championships and there's not going to be all these other qualifications coming down from the head coach, like, take a step back and think about that again, because we've heard from multiple student athletes about the high standards that these national championship coaches really hold to you as you're moving through the sport. Yeah, I agree. And I, and I think I, I remember thinking at Auburn that that was, this must've been some sort of a myth that you can like go to, go to class when you wanted to and skip this class. Like, I think 90% of my classes, they took attendance, first oh, of all. So like, yeah, I, I had to be I there. Remember. I <laughs> and think then I, I realized... remember one time them calling your name and we're all like, <laughs> he's competing internationally. He'll be here next week. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Sometimes I had an excused absence, but even I realized uh, again, like every university I'm sure is different, but Ms. David Marsh, our, our coach, knew everybody so like he would get calls and be like hey right. uh your 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 boy didn't show up for class today <laughs> and so we uh, there was no hiding there was a high level of accountability for sure well and i will say being on the academic side of things i was probably the one making that phone call to our mm. head coaches of saying i just <laughs> heard from go. a professor that uh, you know student athlete a did not mm -hmm. show up for class today and <laughs> you know it's full circle next thing i know student athlete a is in my office so <laughs> i can completely understand your experience that you went yeah. through there you go <laughs> well jerry this has been a fabulous conversation and i always ask all of my guests as they come on because the podcast <laughs> is called confessions from the sidelines what is your favorite memory of standing on the sidelines or should I say like the pool deck? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, um, you know, I'm trying to think of um, something that might just give a little window into uh, the inner workings of, of the swim team at the time I was there. And um, I, I, I preface this. I'm not sure if you would call, I, I can call this my favorite because it's a little <laughs> odd, but 
uh, and I hope I hope it's appropriate for our, our audience. But we had this tradition in um, in the men's team uh, for the years that I was there. Don't ask me who started it and why it was started, but um, every year before the NCAA championships, we would have one practice where at the end of the practice we would get everybody would get naked and jump off the 10 meter platform uh diving board which was 33 feet up and uh you you had to protect yourself let me say it that way and, and i remember it being funny because they had to schedule that date and they had to make sure that there were no lady lifeguards on duty and everybody had to like clear the deck so we had this the pool deck to ourselves and for whatever reason it was a tradition and we we did it and we got our swimsuits back on and we went went to the locker room so there's a little insight that you probably didn't know happened every year uh, before NCAAs. Maybe it was the mojo that uh, that helped us win championships. <laughs> that but moved you guys the, forward. I will say that swimmers have always had a reputation of being very comfortable in their own skin. So it wasn't quite a big deal to, to us. It was just being silly uh, as we were getting ready for the biggest meet of the year. So that's what we did on the sidelines. <laughs> oh my goodness. That is, I, that's so funny. And I don't think I've ever heard that story, to be honest with you. <laughs> which is hilarious. We kept it secret because no that's one else right. was allowed to be around. So. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's funny. Well, Jeremy, I thank you so much for hopping on, having a conversation with me. I know the listeners have learned so much from you and just your experiences. Thank you, Sarah. It's been an honor to be on here.